2-0 in the SEC for the first time in Jimbo Fisher's career here at Texas A&M. Welcome into the Luchador, I can speak right there, podcast presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors, where they carry all the best gear from the top brands at all the prices you'll love. And now shopping is more convenient than ever at academy.com and on the Academy app. Enjoy free shipping on orders of $25 or more with the sign-in, plus easy in-store or curbside pickup. Shop anytime, anywhere, and find the widest selection of colors, styles, and sizes from grills to fitness equipment to workout clothes. Everything you need to have fun out there is right there at academy.com. He is Billy Lucci, Ooh. and I am David Nuno, and the Ags have won again with a dominant defensive performance once again against a uh, mobile quarterback, and they'll be facing another mobile quarterback here very soon. Well, I thought... That's it? Only 30 seconds? I thought Texas a and Yeah, I mean... I, I thought that game... You talk about a game that... How many times do you go to Cowboy Stadium... Jerry World, A&M Arkansas, and the crazy things start happening. Yep. And when A&M really dominates the first half of the game, and I'm sitting there feeling pretty comfortable. And I was sitting in the stands because it's different there because you watch every replay up there. Like you, you see the whole game on a giant screen. And I was going to go down there to the field at halftime. And I'm like, no, uh, you know what? I'm enjoying this. I'm not messing with this mojo. And then the very first play of the third quarter is a pick six. And you go, all right, here we go again with this. Uh, it's A&M Arkansas, right? Yep. Here we go. And the Aggies just calmly went about their business. And, and very quickly you realize, no, this is not like other A&M Arkansas games. This, this is Texas A&M as a clearly superior football team. Just like it was Texas A&M last week, even though they were only up 6-3 at halftime against Auburn, as a clearly superior football team. Just like, like A&M now has won three SEC games in a row. It's two this year. It's three overall going back to LSU. And, and honestly, David, in their last three SEC games, I think Texas A&M in their last three, that was great, by the way, um, in their last three SEC games, A and M's pretty well beaten the crap out of LSU, Auburn, and Arkansas. And, and look, I I know that's last year's A and M team. That was with Devon A. Chain mm -hmm. and some other guys. That's that was you know Auburn's not supposed to be any good. And then you see what they did with Georgia yesterday. Auburn's got a pretty good defense, is what you're starting to realize. And I think more than anything. Um, but who's got a great defense is Texas A&M. And that, to me, the story of yesterday was this, for me. A&M just, they didn't flinch whenever there seemed to be a momentum swing in a rivalry that is full of wild, unpredictable, just absolutely insane momentum swings like the one we saw last year with KJ's fumble and there, there are kick returns and there's interception and pick sixes and overtimes and all that, they never flinched uh, uh, when, when Arkansas looked like they'd get any momentum, A&M would just calmly went about their business and snuffed it out. You know, Max Johnson loses a fumble, then A&M comes out and forces a three and out, preserves that lead. Max and the offense get back on the field, they start doing some nice things. I, I think they weathered everything. That, they looked like a very poised, mature, and confident football team wire to wire these last two weeks. And on top of that, what, what we saw against Auburn, and it really came out again on Saturday, this is a physical, physical SEC West football team now. And I watch a lot of football around this league this weekend, and there's not as much of that as there has been in some years, Pat. You look at like LSU and Ole Miss and that shootout. This physicality, that was an Arkansas team that went up and down the field against LSU last week. Up and down the field. It came to one final play. K.J. Jefferson had his way. They could do nothing against this Texas A&M defense. And it starts up front, and the A&M O-line has – I'm not saying they're playing dominant football, man, but they've won the battles these last two weeks, and there's no question about it. They've won the battles these last two weeks against – Auburn and Arkansas, the running game is getting going. Le'Veon Moss we'll talk about in a minute. But physicality, man, 
they worked Arkansas over. They made Arkansas. They really made them quit. They, they. I know they scored a late touchdown or whatever, but I mean they made that football team quit, and you don't see that much in this conference in conference games and that's what the Aggies did and man they have set up the showdown we said it when, when they lost to Miami and the world was ending we said listen if they could get through five games at four and one you the one you would quote unquote want to lose and you didn't want to because we knew how miserable everything would be after yeah. week two you'd if you had to lose one of those five, it's it's Miami. If you had to, it was Miami because you're two and zero in conference now, and you're building momentum for these next two massive showdowns: Alabama and Tennessee. Um, you've entered into a situation where now everybody around the country is talking about how good you look, and all they did was beat two, an Arkansas team that's lost three in a row. And an Auburn team that's still going to have a hard time winning uh, more than a couple of SEC games this year. But you've looked so good in doing it, and that's what's got everybody's attention. Right. And the fact that it, it, here's another fact: the fact that KJ Jefferson could do nothing against your defense really legitimized how well this defense is playing because they made him look like a freshman quarterback that, that had no idea how to avoid any pressure or get the ball out of his hand. I still have some notes. Our stats crew gave me up with some notes. So KJ came into this matchup averaging almost six yards a carry versus A&M. On Saturday, he averaged under a yard mm -hmm. per carry, point, negative point two yards per carry on 18 carries, racking up 38 rushing yards, but being sacked seven times for 41 losses, 41 yards of loss. He'd only been sacked once in the two games prior to playing A&M. They got him seven times. The defense bottled him up all that's game BYU long. That's BYU and LSU. I mean, it wasn't New Mexico State and ULM. Right. That, that, that sacked him once in, in eight quarters. Yeah. And, and then uh, the defense, uh, his longest run reached 10 yards. Secondary limited him to 132 yards passing, which is the lowest number since the national champion uh, Georgia held him to 70 yards passing in 2021. Well, and they completely shut him down. The offense... The Arkansas offense had a nice first two drives, and they produced, I think, six points. But even then, they were getting after K.J. Jefferson. It was third they and long. They made some plays on third downs. I think they had, I think they were three for four or four for five. four for five to start off the game. And then I think they got one or two the rest of the way, right? Yep. And so it was just they were getting these long plays on third down. They had a screen pass, a well, well-timed screen. He... He scrambled for one, another play. He had he did have plenty of time, hit the guy for like over the middle on like third and thirteen. So but once but there was already there were already signs even then that the A and M's whipping these guys at the point of attack. They're dominating them up front. So it, it never felt like Arkansas was gonna get a whole lot going offensively. Um it, it, that A and M defense Seven sacks in each of the last two games. That hasn't been done in how long? There's a pretty fascinating stat out there about that. And then 15 tackles for loss. I think, had they, did they have 15 again last yeah, night? Yeah, that's 30 in two games. 30 tackles behind the line of scrimmage in two SEC games back-to-back. -back. And 14 sacks. That's an, those are, like, mind-blowingly incredible Numbers. It feels like the bizarro world because they weren't doing that to start yeah. the year. Well, and, and now listen, they are. Listen, say the name DJ Durkin and give the guy a lot of credit. Yeah. Um, and I don't. I'll be. I'd be interested. You know, I don't know what you'll get from Jimbo in terms of like what's been different. You know, it might be. They I got some notes here if you're interested. So, a buddy, uh, of what's different? Yeah. Well, a buddy of mine mm -hmm. uh, was tracking the players who's a coach. 46 of the 56 snaps, they ran six-man box or more. Mm -hmm. That means, in other words, 82% of the time, they ran a true zone, 75 to 80% of the time. 10 to 15% were more of a man-free uh, robber coverage. Um, so they were basically six-man box most of the game in a true zone, well, which they haven't part done. Part of that is to keep... K.J. Jefferson in front of them. Correct, which and is what we might see against Bama Milrow. and Jackson and, and potentially even Milton a little bit. Uh, 
certainly Walt Jackson Dart, Milro. I mean, look, Jaden Daniels. They're, they're going to play a lot of even yep. even Rattler can move around a little. They're going to play a lot of quarterbacks that can move going forward, and they've done so well in these last couple games against them uh, that you feel good about it. But more than anything, A and M kicked Arkansas's ass on the edge. And Durkin is he, – he is, no matter what anybody said, okay, there's a three-man front. Oh, no. I saw plenty of three-man fronts where they were getting after Arkansas. They were getting after him. So, it, I think DJ Durkin is now comfortable with what he's got. His linebackers are really coming into their own, and I think that's the biggest difference uh, from what we saw last year to this year. Edger and Cooper's playing out of his mind. Torian York looks really good. Chris Russell mm -hmm. the last two weeks has made plays, and, and obviously the big touchdown that came on a, on a corner blitz or a safety blitz, I guess, a nickel blitz from Bryce Anderson coming up, screaming off the edge there. They're coming from all angles. The linebackers are pressuring. Uh, you saw Eni White get, get a sack there late. Uh, Malik Silla's get more play. We're seeing all these things. Jacoby Matthews, now that was a Jordan Gilbert injury, but Jacoby, I thought, looked a little lost at times against Auburn the week before, and now here he is making a couple plays mm -hmm. early. I, man, there, there is nothing not to like about this defense right now. Is it perfect? No, but over two weeks, their last two weeks has been about as close to perfect defense as you can get uh, in, this, in this conference. Now, I wish Arkansas wouldn't have connected on that it was it was the game wasn't over when you when you realize how close a and m was to fumbling away that onside kick uh, it would have gotten at least somewhat interesting with right. you know that's just you see that stuff happen sometimes but really put it away this was garbage time touchdown that they had against a and m and it was frust it was frustrating because i'm sitting there going man they had they had the pick six and they had the two field goals and that was really it. Um, had they not gotten that late touchdown, I, it was it would have been nice because it would have been twelve straight quarters without giving up yeah, a touchdown. Twelve straight quarters without a TD, and and you throw in the New Mexico game where they had one, and you'd be like, well, so how many did Arkansas scored TDs this week? They scored one touchdown, one touch, one offensive touchdown, one offensive touchdown. Auburn had none. Uh, Outside of Miami, ULM had none. none. New Mexico, New Mexico had one. So. In the in the four games outside of Miami, they've given up two touchdowns in sixteen quarters. Man, that's I don't care how you want to nitpick it. I don't care how you want to try to you know take away from what they're doing or anything like that. That that is impressive, impressive mm -hmm. defense, and and they're just absolutely owning the line of scrimmage. They're resetting the line of scrimmage. You know, a yard too deep in opposing backfields now. That D line recruiting stuff is paying off. To that Yahoo who was out there, you know, saying that A and M's, you know, wasting all this D line talent. This guy that, you know, from Baylor who pretends to be a neutral college football writer now that he's gone somewhere, like to say that that talent is it, it, wasted or is it being developed? Because what you're seeing is guys like Shamar Turner and Walter Nolan like take a step into yep. being elite. SEC defensive lineman now. And then McKinley Jackson's been that dude. And that play he made on that fourth down, even though it was a seven for seven trade when you count the pick six, mm -hmm. even though AM went down and scored, beautiful play call and to Ernest Crown over for beautiful. the second time. They're doing some nice work with that fullback. But even when you, you know, even though it was kind of a seven for seven, it's still like to me that was a statement moment in yep. that football game to say, "Hey, Pittman, you guys think you, you got something good there with KJ Jefferson and Rocket Sanders? Our defense is better than those two guys." And by the way, David, they've also been tackling they very have. well, gang tackling. They looked, they missed about five tackles on that screen pass to Rocket Sanders, who, by the way, is one of the elite running backs in this league, and he really, outside of that screenplay, did nothing. I got his numbers. Read here. the numbers. And Thirty-four you know. yards rushing on eleven carries, yep. and then two for thirty-six yards receiving. And one of the that that catch yarder. was thirty-eight. So his yeah. other catch was a lot. He had one. He had one play of any significance 
on 14 or so, 13 touches. Only one of them was significant in even the slightest. So they, they rendered K.J. Jefferson and Rocket Sanders worthless. Mm -hmm. and, and it's because they dominated that Arkansas O-line. And, and Auburn's issue was their O-line. If you have an O-line issue, you're going to have a problem with this football team. Yes. And if you have a good O-line, you're going to be surprised by how many issues they cause you. But if you're not good up front, so like I still think Bama has questions up front. Absolutely. And they're saying they've gotten better since Texas. Maybe. Maybe they haven't played a D-line like this one yet. Milro was and, sacked a bunch yesterday, right? Yeah, and, and Milro, here's the other thing. Uh, you got South Carolina coming in here, and, and they can't protect Rattler. Um, Tennessee, well, yeah. again, like they've got a rebuilt O-line from last year. I, I just think when you look at the matchups, there are very few Saturdays where a and is not going to control the front. And I watched, I watched Ole Miss last night and go, man, they looked incredible. But they're playing against one of the worst defenses in college football. And that's crazy to say when we're talking about LSU. Two that weeks is one in a of row. the worst defenses in college football. Disgustingly bad. So what did Ole Miss do when they played a good D-line? Nothing. A week before, they scored 10 points against Bama. When, when you can't block guys, and I've seen this happen in the, uh, you know, in the flip side where A&M's been in that role, when you can't block, you can't win. You don't really have a chance. So all the plays you think you're drawing up, everything you think is good, it, you, when you can't block, you can't win. And, and a lot of teams are going to walk away from playing A&M feeling that way. Sam Pittman said as much. In his post game presser yesterday, he's just like, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't block him. He said DJ Durkin and, and, and defense did everything they prepared for and practiced for, but it didn't matter because they just couldn't stop it. And that's that's what great players will do. And Anum's got him in the front seven, and and Edger and Cooper is playing at a, a first team All SEC level right now. These last few weeks, he's been he's been playing. Absolutely lights out. And so has, again, that whole, I think the whole front seven has. And, and they're, in a, uh, they're in a great rhythm right now. They've got a great energy about them. They're mm -hmm. gang tackling. They're celebrating. They're having fun. They're expecting to make stops. Um, Bama should have their hands full with this defense. And if Bama can't run – then Milrow will be under a, a great, great deal of pressure. So that, that's going to be the matchup, I think, the first thing that really jumps out uh, at me about Saturday. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about what's happening around the SEC and then kind of charting. If A&M continues going in this direction... Oh, uh, go ahead. sorry. You want to interrupt? Save that. Okay. And let's come back to that. We haven't talked any about Anias? the Aggie offense. Okay, let's and do we it. We haven't said much of a word. Um. Max Johnson, Anaya Smith, Le'Veon Moss, uh, Evan Stewart, Jake Johnson, mm -hmm. Max? offensive line. Yeah, I think Max. Did Max I, Wright had a couple catches. Oh, Max Wright. I thought yeah. you were saying Max Johnson. Like, I thought I said Max. Um, yeah, Max Wright. The tight end position mm -hmm. in general. Uh, they made a couple big catches in that one, especially Jake on that third down yeah, where he reached behind. I mean, that was a hell of a catch. Um, he looked like um, – on that play, he looked like Brock Bowers making that catch and same, same number, right? But the offense, it wasn't – it was far from a perfect day. I mean, you, Some you drops. throw a pick six. You, uh, you know uh, – There's There was four drops that I remember. Well – and Jade Walker probably had three, three of them. Three of those. And, and then he I had believe a rough day. And Amari had the one on the – on the uh, oh yeah, he was open. A, that would have been a nice play. Yeah, yep. yep. Running back, running back. Sometimes they don't, you know. Yeah, but yeah, some drops that hurt him. The obviously that pick six and I, did Jimbo talk about that after the game? What happened there? It, I don't remember. That it just didn't up. look right. Yeah, I don't know if if Anias didn't know which play it was or if 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 Max should have seen that not thrown. I don't know or if it was just a great. 
Incredible read by the defender. It looked slow developing. It looked like Jimbo talked more about the fumble, I believe. There was a, the snap exchange. Slash. Oh, on the yeah, yeah, on the mesh there. That was that was one. Those tend to happen. You know, Max get got lit up on the one. He's got to be careful now. He came out of that game and you saw Henderson warming up, and you're going, "Uh oh, is that it for the rest of the year? Do you have a, a you're you're going to your third string quarterback in game in game five? Is that where we're at?" But Max came back. He looked good. He made. He immediately made a really nice throw. I thought so. I thought Max Johnson played a hell of a game. Sands the ball security, and that's hard to say because that's obviously a very big thing. But when you win as comfortably as they did, and again, I don't know on that pick six what should have happened. That could have been just a receiver missing a block, and that's just all you do is catch it and throw it. Right. And it's just that's how it has to be. Um. But the ball security as a, as a, you know, in the running game has to pick up. But I thought Max, well, first of all, he came out like a house of, on fire. Hey, dude. Second, I really liked the way he came back from those turnovers. He came back and he wasn't shaking. Even he got dinged up, came back. He wasn't shaking. He, he's a warrior, that dude. And he got him again with his legs. That long 35 or so yard run there. 57 yards. 57 yards rushing. Um, he just. He's solid. It's man. weird, man. Like, he's somewhere of. He, he kind of combines to me, and QBs hate hearing it, but he like combines to me the, the game manager and playmaker. He makes big plays and he does it. He can do it with his arm or his, or his legs. And I'll say this. He made some passes that were big, big league passes. Like, you know, elite arm strength, mm -hmm. accuracy, no fear of putting them. After he threw that pick, he threw another one where the Arkansas guy jumped up to try, you know, and when he threw it, you're going, uh-oh. But he really was just a great throw. He, he threw it higher than the guy could jump, and it was a perfect strike. So I think, uh, I think that was the one to Max Wright maybe. But I thought Max played – Terrific. Um, the O line, that was interesting to me. You'd look up and there would be Dewberry yeah. and, and Crown over. And then you'd look back and it was Basantis and Naboo. So they were, they were mixing some things up there early. O line's getting better, David. Yeah. Arkansas's got a pretty, Arkansas's got some pretty good dudes on their defensive front. They're not like what AM's going to see this weekend. And I don't think, they were quite you know, Miami, but they have some dudes on their defensive front. So does so does Auburn. Auburn's got some experience up there, and a And just in the last couple of weeks has just gotten better and better up front. And you know, Max was sacked. Was he sacked? No, he wasn't sacked at all. He wasn't sacked once. Um, there was hardly any. There were hardly any tackles for loss e either. I don't know if you're looking at games. Tackles for loss. Um, let's see. Looks like a had 15. Arkansas had four. Yeah, four tackles for loss is, is not a high number. Six and, yards. You know, so I think uh, what'd you say? Six, Six yards. Yeah. So not nothing much at all mm -hmm. behind the line of scrimmage. I I thought the Aggies have been playing noticeably better each week along the offensive line. And I'm, they're not there yet, and I'm not saying that. But, man, if you didn't watch them Saturday and go, okay, this group's better. I mean, they clearly won the battle against Auburn and Arkansas yep. in the trenches. So, you know, Evan Stewart, I wish he would have been healthy the whole game. I think he could have done work against yep. that secondary. He had that big early catch. Massive catch there in, in the uh, – First drive. Early in the fourth quarter. Oh, yeah, in the fourth quarter, yeah. Early in the fourth where he took one right in the helmet-to-helmet -helmet how the hell is Arkansas not flagged for one penalty in an entire game? The entire they had game. 11, uh, I think 11 last week against LSU. Penalties killed them against BYU. They don't get flagged one time. And that was a blatant targeting, yeah. you know, on, on Evan there, which would have been nice because I don't think, I don't think the Aggie scored a touchdown on that drive. I think that was a field goal one. By the way, you know, Bond needs to pick it up. Yep. You know, you can't you can't be missing two important kicks like that, you know, in an S and they they weren't short. They were what, 48 and 49. Were, yeah. Uh but they've they got to start making. Their guy made two from over 50. 
A M's guy missed two from about that same range. So you, he you missed get, a forty nine er and yeah. a forty eight. Yeah, and they're not; those are hard kicks. But yeah. you got to get them. You got to get, get them. And in one of them, he hit off off the upright. So I'm not I'm not worried about it. He's not missing badly. And like I said, those are hard kicks. But you you got to make those in these these type of games moving forward. But I thought the receiving core outside of uh, you know Walker had a tough one. Um. He, you know, he was getting grabbed a little bit, and he was. But you got to fight through those. Anias freaking oh Smith, gosh. man. The last three weeks, right? You just keep seeing him. Do, he had he had the big game against ULM. It's like okay, we needed to see something big from him. We got it. Then he does it against Auburn. Nice game, some big plays against Auburn. Okay, here we go now. What he did, what he did Saturday. It was ridiculous. He made a couple of really nice catches. Great catch over the middle and an absolute dart from Max early. <clears throat> Another one where he caught it and he scrambled around. Uh, but that punt return was as highlight reel. He remind, that looked like Dante Hall to me yeah. on that punt return. It was video game-esque. I mean, he muffs it. He picks it up. He starts going. And by the way, The he muff almost, helped. It threw off the timing. Yeah. And that guy outkicked the coverage. Twice, and I just had two good returns, but that was spectacular. He had that 202 return, all-purpose yards. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, that, that punt return for touchdown, not only did it – they weren't, even Pittman said, we weren't coming back anyway. By Which, the way, let me just say that. I'm sorry, Billy. Arkansas had 174 total yards. Anias had 202 all-purpose yards. Yeah, and Arkansas – they had that late drive. It kind of pissed me off because they – throws those numbers off a little bit. Yeah, it did. I wanted uh, – and I wanted A&M to punch that one in Well, at the I end. had the video. It looks like he punched it in before the whistle came. I, I shot it from the end zone. It looked like he was – Really? In. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so – but offensively, it was a good game. It was a good game. If they would have cleaned it up, it was very close to being a great game. So let me ask you this about that, because I don't want this to be a complaint, because it's not a complaint. Anytime you beat an SEC team by double digits, I love it. I'm happy. But I, I guess the only thing that I was somewhat disappointed by was that domination didn't match the kind of score I wanted to see. <coughs> and again, there was the drops, there was the missed field goals, there was the pick six. So you throw that, but like it felt worse than 34-22. to 22. That's, I guess, my point. Yeah, and it was, and everybody that watched the game knew it. Mm -hmm. We can try to project and parlay like, man, if they turn it over three times against this team or that team or the other team, they're going to lose. Or That's everybody. They, they do these fault, but but those other teams are going to make mistakes too. Mm -hmm. We've seen enough SEC now to know. Yeah, if you play a perfect game, if a and plays a perfect game against any of the teams remaining on their schedule, the Aggies are going to win. They're good enough that their A-plus game is going to beat everyone on the schedule. I'm not saying every time, but their A-plus should beat yep. everyone. a and not going to we, – we've seen enough to know, like, those games are going to be hard to come by, the A-plus, you know, the perfect game, so to speak. But no one else around the league is doing that either. So, yes, of course those mistakes will come back to haunt you. Unless you get a pick six of your own – and you get seven sacks and 15 tackles for loss, and you have a running back go over 100, and, and you, you come out early and put up 17 in the first half, and you have a punt return for a touchdown. And, you know, so, yeah, I would love that score to look different. I would love for A&M to have just raced away from Auburn and Arkansas. That's preferred because you, you, to get there, they would have been playing cleaner, you know. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully they'll get there. So they are if getting better at everything. They're trending better at everything, so mm -hmm. it is certainly something they can do. But I don't think it's anything to be disappointed or frustrated in. It is something you acknowledge and look at and go, man, if you really want to do this, and by this, I, you know, we're talking about win the SEC West, play Georgia for the SEC title, or Kentucky. I'm only half kidding here. Right. Georgia looked shaky. Again? You know, they, they haven't – you think Georgia would trade for A&M's offense right now? Yeah. And you think they'd trade Bobo for and, Petrino? And you think too. they'd trade Max for uh, Carson Beck? You think – yeah. And 
Maybe defense. Or, uh, who knows? What Georgia's about, defense. May, maybe the D line. I don't know. But, but but what are they? What did Auburn do against yeah, Georgia? They did a did, lot more than they did yeah. against A and M. That's for sure. Um, so my point though is, if you want to get there, we all know they're just going to have to you know continue to improve on the things. You know, there were a couple false starts that hurt them again. That you know they that was damn near a disaster on that punt where you jumped and and then and then they brought the the offense back yeah. out. It actually ended up. Working in your fa- two things that worked in A and M's favor were jumping off sides on a punt return team that kind of just drew Pittman in right. to to try to go for it, and then McKinley made that terrific play. And the other thing was Anias kind of muffing that punt, and it kind of threw the timing off of everything there, and he ran in for a touchdown. It was one of those kind of days for A and M, which is again, it was just really fun to see. How many times do you go to Jerry World? And sit back and just enjoy an Arkansas game relatively. We didn't have to worry. Relatively low stress. And yeah. again, they came back to within one play into the third quarter. It was seventeen thirteen, and then it was twenty to sixteen. So it was it was close, but, but it didn't feel close. You just felt like A and M was the better team, and over the span of sixty minutes, that was going to play itself out. How often do you feel that way? In that stadium, I think this was only the second time. A and M routed them in 2012 with Johnny. They routed them in 2020 here at Kyle Field. They won. It was it was a back and it was an up and down game, but they beat them 45 33 in Fayetteville. The one time they went there in 13. Um, I'm trying to think of. If I'm not mistaken, man, this is only the second what I would call comfortable and certainly an ass-kicking, but I would go back to the Trevor Knight, Travion Williams, Keith Ford game where A&M, uh, that Trevor had the long run, I think, to tie it right before halftime. They just blew the doors off of him in the second half, and they did it running the football. 45-24 is what Dalton said that score was. And I think that's the only other one. Now, I said run the football. Le'Veon Moss, man, I talked about him this week. I told you what they were saying about him in practice, David. He comes out and has that 100-yard game. He almost had one last, what do you have, 97 last week. Yep. So he's averaging in two games, two SEC games now over 100 yards in each. You go back to last year when A-Chain ran for uh, eight, Achan. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Lucci, Liucci, Nuno, 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 Nuno. Nuno. Achan. Achan ran for 228 yards. In their last three SEC games, you know. Moss with 97 against Auburn, but they're getting, they're running the football against the real teams. And I thought, I thought Amari Daniels had some tough runs, uh, but Le'Veon Moss looks like, like I said the other day, he looks like that SEC West running back that you look at on tape before you play in him and you go, oh, shoot. He's legit. This dude's a problem. He's yep. fast, he's big, he can run through tackles, he's got vision. And and he puts his head down and gets through his gets through power, that first wave of defenders. He's he's got some moves. Yeah, he's got some real explosiveness to him uh, when he's when he's going through traffic there. And I I thought vision too. I I'm I'm very impressed with Le'Veon Moss. And if they can keep building that up to go with what they're doing in the passing game, man. And, and Noah was back, and that was just a quick. Got a quick glimpse at Noah. I, I think I don't know where that's going to go with him. Like I'm, I'm trying to think: is he is it going to be the Evan Anias show? And then one week it's Noah, one week it's Moose, one week it's Jude Walker with a few catches. Is that kind of where we're going with it? And, and obviously the tight ends, or is Noah kind of just kind of that was the first game back, and then. Maybe this Saturday mm-hmm. you see two highlight real catches by, by Noah Thomas. You know, like, I'll be interested to see what he adds to the receiving core 
now that he's back because it's been pretty quiet, you know, since week one. It really has. And and a lot's gone on between, you know, his personal life with the tragedy and family and then also the, the injury he's been working through. So who knows, man? You might see a big game from number three this week or next week at Tennessee or wherever to really help A&M win. But that, they're doing it right now, these last two weeks, really essentially without him. And they just still keep looking better and better on offense. So I, I think this was not perfect, but I think the turnovers were what really, uh, what really hurt it. And then the drop passes, I think, early on. And, you know, you had to go with a field goal drive. Two, I think two field goals instead of touchdowns were one, you, you know, you clanged it. But they, they killed a couple of drives, or this, this offense, I don't think Arkansas did a very good job. They didn't stop them in the first half. They did in the second, but again, it was kind of self-inflicted. I love the way that they just responded to that adversity and just said, you know, we're going to line up, we're going to run the football, mm-hmm. we're going to hit you with some play action, we're going to get in the shotgun and let Max sling it around. They never came off of what they were trying to do offensively. They didn't let the pressure of the game dictate that they, there was no tightening up, and they just went out there and kept playing, and, and it paid off. So this sets up huge showdown with Bama. Ugh. And then considering what is happening around the SEC with LSU losing their second game this year and Ole Miss now splitting, um, you saw the Georgia Auburn game, Missouri looking good right now, but they got a real test this weekend. Mm-hmm. So just uh, kind of let's navigate. Hey, do they have a test or does LSU have a real test? Well, there you go. Maybe LSU has a test. LSU, I, I'm just tell you right now, LSU might end up with three losses. They go up there to Columbia at an 11 a.m. for an 11 a.m. kickoff with an undefeated Missouri team up there. Um, I'm just telling you, that's. That's a danger zone game for LSU coming off the loss they just had uh, and the way, you know, kind of that, that massive letdown at the end. That's one of those games, David, where all of a sudden, you know, LSU, I'd be interested to see their injury report this week. How many guys just magically aren't going to be suited up Saturday, you know, at Mizzou where guys are just kind of a little banged up but kind of feeling sorry for yourself. Mm-hmm. You just lost your second game. You thought you were going to be a national champ. That's a danger zone game for LSU. Um, Arkansas is in a world of trouble, aren't they? Yeah. They're at Ole Miss this weekend. Then they're then they play Bama. I think it's at Bama. Like they're done. Arkansas might. They're probably going to be looking at five losses in a row and an zero and four SEC start. You got to wonder what Sam Pittman the temperature of his seat is. Not for this year, but like to go into Long next term. year on the yeah. hot seat, which stinks because he's one of the better people and more likable coaches in the league. But it is about winning and losing. Those Arkansas fans are frustrated right now. They're not frustrated in Oxford. Um, that's a massive win for Lane Kiffin and the boys because now they're one and one, like you said. But they beat. They've played Bama and LSU already. So. <laughs> Yeah. So they've gotten the two, which are still, until A&M proves otherwise, they've gotten the two toughest tests behind them. Now, they do play Georgia at Georgia. Okay, so they have three massively tough tests. Two of them are behind them. The way they play would seem like it could be problematic for Georgia. Of course, we thought that with Bama, and then Bama just choked them out. But who knows? But, but Ole Miss... I don't think they have staying power in it. And I think yeah. I do think they'll lose to Georgia, and if they just if they lose one more, then they're then they're out of you know out of even the two loss, three way tie consideration thing. So this is separation Saturday, I believe in terms of Texas A and M, Bama, and and if LSU gets got, if LSU gets got in Columbia. The winner of A and M Bama will have a. It's crazy we're saying this, right? But the winner of A and M Bama will have a ton of work to do, especially if it's A and M, because I think A and M's got a lot of tougher games. Mm-hmm. The winner of A and M Bama though would be in, in a tremendous position in the SEC West, especially if it's Bama, because they will have already beaten Ole Miss and A and M. But if A&M does it and they're sitting there at 3-0 in the league 
And if LSU drops, goes up to Columbia and drops their second conference game, um, to a and M's none, and then you're looking at Bama with you essentially have a two game lead over them because you'd have the tiebreaker. Bama and LSU still have to play. Ole Miss still has to play uh, Georgia. So you'd be in a, a pretty, pretty strong spot. You'd certainly be in one to say seven and one probably wins you the league. Well, follow me here. Are yeah, we... you had this very pensive face well, you were hitting I, I, me with. I just remember 20... almost like. I, I, Go ahead. Like I, you look like a wooden look, puppet. You remember 2020? I got the, this gig coming out of that season, yeah. right? And then, unfortunately, with backup quarterback, they go eight and four. And Be that's, careful; they might start blaming you. Well, and then all the talk about Jimbo. Like, mm. why do they give him a contract? He eight and four. That's not what we paid for. What if LSU goes eight and four? We're gonna hear about Brian Kelly the yeah. way we heard about Jimbo. You are. You actually are. But are you? Yeah. I mean. Yeah, they I don't know. Not probably not to the extent that people were so focused on that nationally, but yeah, it's amazing how fast the heat can be turned up in this league. And and Brian Kelly, how are you going to handle if they go lose at Missouri and they've lost three games by <clears throat> by mid season? No one's going to be sitting there going, "Oh, he won the West last year." They don't want to hear that in Baton Rouge. In his head, he's going to be like, "I inherited." A mess and Ed O and I won the damn West last year and beat Bama and you guys are already that's not gonna sit well with him. That's mm-hmm. that's where it gets interesting in Baton Rouge. And then for A and M these next two weeks, really more Bama game because that's the most immediate one, but this next game, it really just beyond it sets you up. Your season, I don't want to say comes down to these next two weeks. But this is like, when you talk about separation Saturday, mm-hmm. this weekend, followed by going to Knoxville. Like that, th- those are two huge, when we're talking about maybe competing to win the West, it could come down to what happens here. You got a lot after, I know. Yeah, you do. But these two, massive, but starts Saturday, 2.30 CBS. If a and playing football the way they, they've played the last couple of weeks, and, and I mean the way they've played in the trenches, the way they've gotten after it on defense – uh, beginning to run the football with some success. Playmakers making plays, you know, at receiver. Max Johnson playing like the guy that Max Johnson can play like. Mm-hmm. Which I'm telling you, I mean, go around the league this week and see how many of these teams would have wanted Max Johnson as their QB. Uh, I know Sam Pittman probably would have. Although, huh, with the way that, that Aggie defense is getting after, Max would have had problems with, with that too. Yep. Um, but man, it, if they can get this, this one, this weekend, I, I think you would come out of Saturday, you'd go into Saturday evening and people around the country would be saying, Texas A&M is your, Texas A&M is, you, you, you know, right now. They are in the best position to win the West, and that is a beatable Georgia team. They got to beat Bama first. Alabama's good. They okay, good. they are still, and I mean this, I believe this. I think that's the worst Bama team Saban's had since his first one up there. You know, he won the title. Did he win it in year three or year two? But since his first Bama team, this is. I still think, like, just not only with the quarterback. Uh, not only with the quarterback, you know, indecisiveness when they went from Milrow and back, and then, but I just think even though their defense is really good, it's still not the players of that defense that was scoring multiple touchdowns on defense. It felt like every week over the course of like a two year stretch, and you know, seventeen first round picks in two years, and every year a top five player in the draft along the D line. It felt like. They're not of that ilk anymore. Mm-hmm. They, still, they, they still might win the SEC. If they come beat A&M, uh, that team can go toe-to-toe with Georgia right now. Mm-hmm. So they still might be the class of the SEC. They're certainly, along with Georgia, the two heavyweights and the two premier programs. Um, get this. Texas A&M, their last two meetings with Bama, it came down to from me to you on one play, final play of the game. 
and it came down to a field goal, Seth Small, to win the game. Their last two meetings with Bama have been decided on the final play of the game. And they really were a yard and a half away from having taken the field Saturday looking to beat Bama for a third straight time. Nick Saban knows how close A&M was to beating them last year with Milrow at quarterback. He knows what this Aggie defense is starting to look like. He knows what it's like to come into Kyle Field and what this atmosphere is going to be. Uh, this is probably as big a game as there is in college football this weekend. The Texas OU will be one because they're both undefeated, which to me on the Oklahoma side anyway is a complete fraud. Um, but this is one of the two biggest games in the country this weekend, yeah. without question. And, man, I think if you can get this thing, David – uh, there are these opportunities and what you're trying to build and what Jimbo is trying to build. And, and, you know, for all the knocks and all the times they've, you know, they've slipped off the path, including, you know, the entirety of last season, including Miami a few weeks ago. Just like I said with Brian Kelly, if he goes in and loses to Missouri Saturday and they, they're, they're, you know, one and two in the SEC and they've lost three games. A lot of stuff changes in terms of how that's perceived. You can change. Uh, you can change the way everyone around the country thinks about Texas A and M. Not just, you know, for by beating Bama and saying, "Wow, they've done it again," but also in terms of this year's SEC race. You've thrust yourself right into the mix, and you've got the perfect opponent coming in here. I know there are easier teams you could play. But to get Alabama at Kyle Field at this specific point in time, I think it, it just feels right. I think it's perfect. I think it's exactly what this team needs uh, to test themselves against. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, David. Thank you, Academy Good. Sports and Outdoors. It's the Luchador Podcast.